War is a national crisis. It is necessary to examine the grounds of death and life and the ways to survival and extinction. Thus, you measure militias in terms of five parameters, comparing them in terms of strategic measurements to find out the real situation. First is guidance, second climate, third is ground, fourth leadership, fifth is order. Guidance is what induces popular accord with the rulership. So the people are willing to follow it to death and follow it in life without opposition. Climate refers to darkness and light, cold and heat, the structure of the seasons. Ground may be high or low, near or far, treacherous or easy, broad or narrow, deadly or viable. Leadership is a matter of knowledge, trustworthiness, humaneness, valor, and strictness. Order involves organizational structure, chain of command, and logistics. All leaders have heard of these five things. Those who know them prevail over those who do not. That is why we make comparisons in terms of strategic measurements to find out the real situation. Which civil leadership has guidance? Which military leadership has ability? Whose climate and grounds are advantageous? Whose order is enforced? Whose forces are stronger? Whose officers and soldiers are better trained? Whose rewards and punishments are clearer? In this way, I know who is going to win and who is going to lose. If leaders listen to my strategy, their military actions will be victorious. Then I will stay. If leaders do not listen to my strategy, their military actions will be failures. Then I will leave. One can assess advantages through listening, then take up an appropriate posture or make an appropriate disposition to bolster one's exterior. To take up a posture or a disposition means to manipulate strategy according to advantage. Warfare is a path of subterfuge. That is why you make a show of incompetence when you are actually competent. Make a show of ineffectiveness when you are in fact effective. When nearby, you appear to be distant, and when distant, you appear to be nearby. Seducing opponents with prospects of gain. Take them over by means of confusion. Even when you're solid, still be on the defensive. Even when you're strong, be evasive. Use anger to make them upset. Humility to make them arrogant. Tire them while taking it easy. Cause division among them while acting friendly. Attack where they are unprepared and emerge when they least expect it. This means that the victories of warriors cannot be told of beforehand. Those who figure out how to win before doing battle have the majority of advantageous plans, while those whose schemes prove to be failures, even before battle, have fewer advantageous plans. Those with many such plans win, Those with few such plans lose. There's no need to even mention those with no plans. When I view a situation in this way, it becomes evident who will win and who will lose. A general rule for military operations calls for a thousand chariots, a thousand leather-covered wagons, a hundred thousand armored troops, and provisions for several hundred miles. Thus, internal and external expenses, including the needs of ambassadors and advisors, materials such as glue and liqueur, maintenance of vehicles and armor, cost a thousand pieces of gold a day. Only thus can you mobilize a force of a hundred thousand troops. 
In actual combat, what is important is to win. Go on too long and you blunt your troops and snap your edge. Besiege a citadel and your strength is depleted. Keep an army in the field too long and the resources of the nation will be insufficient. When you blunt your troops, snap your edge, deplete your strength, and exhaust your resources, rivals will arise to take advantage of your predicament. Then it will be impossible to effect a good ending, even with knowledge. Therefore, in military affairs, we may hear of being clumsy but swift, while we never see the skillful prolonging in action. This is because a nation never benefits from prolonging a military action. So those who are not completely aware of drawbacks of military action cannot be completely aware of advantages in military action. Those who use militias skillfully do not draft conscripts twice or ship provisions over and over. Taking necessities from the nation and feeding off opponents, the army can thus be sufficiently fed. The reason that nations are impoverished by their armies is that those who send their armies far away ship goods far away. And when goods are shipped far away, the farmers grow poor. Those who are near the army sell dear, and because of high prices, money runs out. When the money runs out, there is increased pressure to appropriate things for military use. Exhausting the heartland, draining the households, this takes up 70% of the peasants' expenses. As for the expenses of the government, the ruined chariots, the horses rendered useless, the armor and weaponry, the oxen and transport vehicles take up 60%. This is why a wise leader strives to feed off the enemy. The amount of the enemy's food you eat is equivalent to 20 times that amount of your own food. The amount of the enemy's fodder you use is equivalent to 20 times that amount of your own fodder. So what gets opponents killed is anger. What gets you the advantage over opponents is the spoils. Thus, in a chariot battle, when your side has captured at least 10 chariots, award them to the first to make a capture. Change the flags and use the chariots together with yours, treating the soldiers well and providing for them. This is called overcoming an opponent and growing even stronger. So in a military operation, what is important is to prevail. It is not good to prolong it. Thus, a leader who commands a militia knowledgeably has the fate of the people in their hands. The safety or danger of the nation is up to them. The general rule for military operations is that keeping a nation intact is best, while destroying a nation is next. Keeping a militia intact is best. Destroying a militia is next. Keeping a battalion intact is best. Destroying a battalion next. Keeping a company intact is best. Destroying a company is next. Keeping a squad intact is best. Destroying a squad is next. Therefore, 100% victory in battle is not the finest skill. Foiling others' military operations without even fighting is the finest skill. Thus, a superior military operation attacks planning. The next best attacks alliances. The next attacks armed forces. The lowest attacks citadels. The rule for attacking a citadel is that it is only done out of sheer necessity. It takes three months to prepare the equipment and another three months to construct earth mounds against the walls of the citadel. When a military leader cannot contain anger and has their soldiers swarm the citadel, this kills a third of their soldiers. With the citadel still not taken, this is a fiasco of a siege. Therefore, one who uses the military skillfully foils the military operations of others without fighting, takes others' citadels without attacking, and crushes other states without taking a long time, 
making sure to remain intact to, to contend with the world, so that their forces are not blunted and the advantage can be complete. This is the rule for planning attack. So the rule for military operations is that if you outnumber opponents 10 to 1, then surround them. 5 to 1, attack them. 2 to 1, fight them. If you're even evenly matched, you can divide them. If you're less, you can defend against them. If you're not as good, then you can evade them. Thus, what would be firmness in the face of a small opponent will get you captured by a large opponent. Military leaders are assistants of nations. When their assistants are thoroughgoing, nations will be strong. When their assistants are negligent, nations will be weak. So there are three ways in which a civilian leader troubles a militia. Calling on the militia to advance unaware that it should not advance at that point, or calling on the militia to retreat unaware that it should not retreat at that point, is called fettering the militia. Civil government participating in the running of the military without understanding military affairs leads to confusion among the soldiers. Civil government sharing the responsibilities of the military without understanding military strategy leads to mistrust among the soldiers. Once your military forces are confused and distrustful, rivals will give you trouble. This is called disorienting the military and bringing in conquerors. There are five ways to know winners. Those who know when to fight and when not to fight are winners. Those who know the uses of large and small groups are winners. Those whose upper and lower echelons have the same desires are winners. Those who await the unprepared with preparedness are winners. Those whose military leaders are capable and not dominated by the civilian leaders are winners. These five items are ways to know winners. So it is said that if you know others and know yourself, you will not be imperiled in a hundred battles. If you do not know others but do know yourself, you will win some and lose some. If you do not know others and do not know yourself, you'll be imperiled in every battle. The ancients who were skilled in combat first became invincible, and in that condition awaited vulnerability on the part of enemies. Invincibility is up to you yourself. Vulnerability depends on the opponent. Therefore, those who are skilled in combat can become invincible, but cannot make opponents vulnerable to certain defeat. This is why it is said that victory can be discerned, but cannot be made. Invincibility is a matter of defense. Vulnerability is a matter of offense. When you defend, it is because you are outgunned. When you attack, it is because the opponent is no match. Those skilled at defense hide in the deepest depths of the earth. Those skilled at offense maneuver in the highest heights of the sky. Thus they can preserve themselves and make victory complete. Those whose perception of how to win is not beyond common knowledge are not the most skillful of experts. It doesn't take much strength to lift a strand of hair. It doesn't take clarity of eye to see the sun and moon. It doesn't take sharpness of ear to hear thunder. Those considered good warriors in ancient times were those who won when it was easy to win. Thus, the victories of good warriors have nothing extraordinary about them. They are not famed for brilliance, not accorded merit for bravado. Thus, their victories in battle are not in doubt. They are not in doubt because the measures they take are sure to win, since they are overcoming those who have already lost. Therefore, those who are skilled in combat take a stand on an invincible ground without losing sight of opponents' vulnerabilities. Thus, a victorious militia wins before ever seeking to do battle, while a defeated militia seeks victory after it has already gotten into a fight.
When those who employ military forces put the way into practice and keep its laws, they can therefore judge the outcome. The laws are as follows. First is measure. Second is capacity. Third is order. Fourth is efficacy. Fifth is victory. The ground gives rise to measures. Measures produce capacity. Capacity gives rise to order. Order produces efficacy. Efficacy gives rise to victory. Thus, a victorious militia is like a weight balanced against another weight that is 500 times less, while a defeated militia is like a weight balanced against another weight that is 500 times greater. Those who get the people to fight from a winning position are as though opening up damned waters into a mile-deep canyon. This is the matter of the formation of force. What normally makes managing a large group similar to managing a small group is a system of order. What makes fighting a large group similar to fighting a small group is the use of emblems and signals. What enables military forces to take on enemies without defeat is the implementation of surprise tactics as well as conventional strategies. What makes a military intervention as effective as a stone thrown on eggs is discernment of openings and solidity. Usually battle is engaged in a conventional matter but is won by surprise tactics. So those who are good at surprise maneuvers are endless as the sky and earth, inexhaustible as the great rivers, finishing, then starting again, as epitomized by the sun and moon, dying, and then being reborn, as epitomized by the four seasons. There are only five notes, but their various combinations are infinite. There are only five colors, but their various combinations are infinite. Combat dispositions are either conventional or extraordinary, but the various combinations of convention and surprise are endless. Surprise and convention give rise to each other in cycles, like a beginningless and endless circle. Who can exhaust them? The fact that the velocity of rushing water can reach the point where it can sweep away boulders is due to momentum. The fact that the strike of a bird of prey can attain a crushing force is due to timing and control. Thus, those skilled at combat make sure their momentum is closely channeled and their timing closely controlled. Their momentum is like drawing a catapult. Their timing and control are like pulling the trigger. In the midst of confusion, they fight wildly without being thrown into disarray. In the midst of chaos, their formations are versatile, so they cannot be defeated. Rebellion arises from orderliness. Cowardice arises from bravado. Weakness arises from strength. Whether there is order or unruliness depends on the operative logic of the order. Bravery and cowardice depend on the configurations and momentum of power. Strength and weakness depend on formation. Therefore, those who are good at maneuvering enemies mold them into specific formations, to which the enemies may be sure to conform. Give opponents an opportunity they are sure to take, maneuvering them in this way, then wait in ambush for them. For these reasons, those who are skilled in combat look to disposition of force and momentum. They do not put the onus on individual people. That is why they can choose people, yet put their trust in momentum. To rely on momentum is to get people to go into battle like rolling logs and rocks. By nature, logs and rocks remain still on even ground and roll when the ground is steep. They remain stationary when square. They roll when round. 
Thus the momentum of people who are good at combat is like rolling round rocks down a high mountain, because of the disposition of force. Generally speaking, those who have taken up their position on a battlefield first and await the enemy there are fresh, while those who take up their position on a battlefield last and thus rush into combat are wearied. Therefore skilled warriors bring others to them and do not go to others. What effectively induces enemies to come of their own accord is the prospect of gain. What effectively prevents enemies from coming is the threat of harm. So to effectively tire a rested enemy, starve a well-fed one, or stir up a calm one, is a matter of going where the enemy is sure to give chase. Those who travel hundreds of miles without fatigue can do so by traveling uninhabited lands. Those who always take what they besiege do so by attacking when there is no defense. Those whose defense always stands firm defend where attack is certain. Therefore, a good attack is one against which an enemy does not know where to defend while a good defense is one against which an enemy does not know where to attack. Be subtle, subtle even to the point of formlessness. Be mysterious, mysterious even to the point of soundlessness. Thus you can control the enemy's fate. To advance unstoppably, strike at openings. To retreat elusively, Move too fast for the enemy to catch up with you. Thus, when you want to fight, the way to let an enemy have no choice but to fight with you, even though he is secure behind high ramparts and deep moats, is to attack where they are sure to go to the rescue. When you don't want to fight, to make an enemy unable to fight with you, even if you are only defending a line drawn on the ground, divert their aim. Thus, if you induce others to adopt a form while you remain formless, then you will be concentrated while the enemy will be divided. When you are concentrated and thus united, whereas the enemy is divided into ten, you are attacking with ten times their strength. So you are a large contingent while the enemy is in small groups. If you can attack small groups with a larger contingent, then you will have fewer to fight against at a time. Your battleground should be unknown, because if it is unknown, then the enemy will have to post many defensive positions. And when the enemy has to man many defensive positions, then you will have fewer people to fight against at a time. Thus, when they are manned in front, they are undermanned in the rear. When they are manned in the rear, they are undermanned in the front. When manned at the left, they are undermanned to the right. When manned at the right, they are undermanned to the left. When they are manned everywhere, they are undermanned everywhere. Those who are undermanned are those who are on the defensive against others. Those who have plenty of personnel are those who cause others to be on the defensive against them. Therefore, if you know the ground of combat and the day of combat, you can go to battle hundreds of miles away. If you do not know the ground of combat or the day of combat, then your left flank cannot help your right flank. Your right flank cannot help your left flank. Your forward wing cannot help your rear guard, and your rear guard cannot help your forward wing. How much less can they help each other when there is a distance of miles? According to my calculations, although the enemy has many troops, still that hardly increases their chances of victory. That is why I say victory can be achieved. Even if the enemy is numerous, they can be made to not fight. Thus you plot against them to discern winning and losing strategies. You work on them to discern their patterns of action. You induce them to adopt specific formations to discern deadly and viable grounds. You skirmish with them to discern where they are sufficient and where they are lacking. 
so the consummate formation of a militia is to reach formlessness. Where there is no specific form, even deeply placed agents cannot spy it out. Even the canny strategist cannot scheme against it. When you plan victory for the masses based on formation, the masses cannot discern it. Everyone knows the form of your victory, but no one knows the form by which you achieved victory. This is why a victory in battle is not repeated. Adaptive formation is of endless scope. The formation of a militia is symbolized by water. Water travels away from higher places toward lower places. Military victory is a matter of avoiding the solid and striking at openings. The course of water is determined by earth. The way to military victory depends on the opponent. Thus a militia has no permanently fixed configuration, no constant form. Those who are able to seize victory by adapting to opponents are called experts. No element is always dominant. No season is always present. Some days are shorter, some are longer. The moon wanes away and then reappears. The general rule for military operations is that the military leadership gets the order from the civilian leadership to assemble an army, gather troops, and mass at the front. Nothing is harder than armed struggle. The difficulty of armed struggle is making a circuitous route into the most direct way, turning problems into advantages. Thus, when you take a circuitous route, thereby leading on opponents with the prospect of gain, leaving after others but arriving before them, then you are the one who knows strategic use of circuitousness's directness. Thus armed struggle can be profitable and can be perilous. If you mobilize the whole army to fight for the advantage, you will be too late. If you leave the army behind to fight for advantage, then equipment will be lost. Thus, if you rush off with your armor in storage, marching double-time day and night to fight for advantage too far away, then your top command will be captured. The strongest will get there first, laggards later, and as a rule, only one in ten will make it at all. If you struggle for advantage at a considerable distance, your vanguard commander will be felled, and as a rule, only half your force will ever get there. If you struggle for advantage at a somewhat lesser distance, then two out of three will get there. Therefore, an army will perish if it has no equipment, no food, or no reserves. So, those who do not know the plans of competitors cannot enter capably into preliminary negotiations. Those who do not know the lay of the land cannot maneuver a militia. Those who do not use local guides cannot gain the advantages of the terrain. Therefore, a military force stands on deceit and moves according to advantage. Division and combination are the means of adaptation. When it moves swiftly, it is like the wind. When it moves slowly, it is like a forest. When it raids, it is like fire. When it is still, it is like a mountain. Inscrutable as the darkness, it moves like thunder rumbling. To plunder an area, it distributes its troops. To broaden territory, it parcels out defense of the critical positions. Action is taken away after weighing strategy. The first side to know how to make strategic use of circuitous and direct routes is the one to win. This is a law of armed conflict. A classic on military order says, Gongs and drums are used because words cannot be heard. Pennants and flags are used because soldiers cannot see each other. Thus, gongs and drums are mostly used in night combat, 
while pennants and flags are mostly used in day combat. Gongs, drums, pennants, and flags are means of unifying the people's eyes and ears. Once the people are unified, then the bold cannot push ahead alone, while the timid cannot fall back alone. This is the rule for employing a large group. Thus the armed forces may have their spirit taken away, while the generals may have their heart taken away. In this connection, in the morning spirits are keen, in the afternoon spirits fade, in the evening spirits wane away. Therefore good warriors avoid keen spirits, instead striking enemies when their spirits are fading and waning. This is the mastery of mood. To face confusion with composure and face clamor with calm is the mastery of heart. To stay close to home, to face those who come from far away, to face the weary in a condition of ease, to face the hungry with full stomachs, is the mastery of strength. Not to stand in the way of an orderly march and not to attack an impeccable battle line is the mastery of adaptation. So rulers for military operations are not to face high ground, not to get backed up against a hill, not to pursue a feigned retreat, not to attack fresh troops, not to chase after decoys, not to try to stop an army on the way home, to leave a way out for a surrounded army, and not to press a desperate enemy. These are the rules for military operations.